Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Mars Stream, uh, the public broadcasting platform of the Marsh. Uh, I'm David Harada, and I am your host for the evening for our Works in Progress series that we've been doing here for um, over 30 years now. So uh, we're glad to have you all here. Um, and I'm also the tech, so I'm right now setting up the screen for the show. Um, so here at the Mars Stream, we've got programming going on just about every night of the week. Uh, tomorrow is our Wild Card Tuesday series, but we're actually on break for the election. So uh, I don't feel like I have to say it, but if you haven't voted already, get out and vote. Uh, Wednesday, our Solo Arts Heal series will be having a replay of our episode with Fred Johnson. He's a musician. He's traveled the world open for people like Miles Davis and Aretha Franklin. It's recorded with many of them. And he's currently doing, among other things, a, uh, a project. It's a collaboration between the NEA and the Veterans Administration working on music as a, as a healing process. Um, so that's on Wednesday night at 7.30, Solo Arts Heal. Thursday night, Stephanie's Mars Stream, the interview program run by our founder, and artistic director Stephanie Wiseman. She will be talking to Marjorie O'Driscoll, a photographer and activist, urbanist, um, who's done some really fascinating work kind of on the streetscape of San Francisco during the pandemic. So that's Thursday at 7.30. Friday night is our new game show, uh, The Smartest Person in the Room, hosted by the fantastic Don Reed. It's a really fun uh, show. We do two rounds of that. That's Thursday nights. Um, Saturday night this weekend, our solo uh, performance spotlight will be a re replay of uh, Judas C's Welcome to the Cancer Cafe, a comedy about uh, her experience dealing with cancer. And it's a wonderful show. That's this weekend. Um, all this is on our website, uh, themarsh.org, so you can find links to that. All our programming is free here online, but if you can support us through our tip jar, um, there's a link in the chat. Uh, welcome also to our viewers on YouTube Live. Uh, we'll be doing a uh, little bit of Q&A with the performers. We've got three short performances tonight, and we'll be doing a Q&A at uh, the end with them. So uh, thank you all for being here. And um, so I'm going to turn this over to uh, our first performer. And uh, Ruth Kirchner is a veteran playwright and we are really happy to have her here tonight. She's going to be doing a piece no, uh, called The House of Misery. So let's turn it over to you, Ruth. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, first two notes before I start. Uh, first note, I'm reading, by the way. I'm not an actor. Uh, tonight in the program, it mentions Shakespeare's Othello. That should have been King Lear. My bad. So, cancel Othello, it's Lear. Next, um, I transcribed verbatim some of the text tonight from other speakers whose names I'm not including. Uh, they'll be credited someday when their collective stories are performed. Okay, tomorrow's the election. Uh, we've all voted, and the last four years have felt like a prison. I grew up in the 60s. Okay, we marched, we ended the war. So, this, mm -mm. and then COVID feels like a prison. Stuck at home wearing masks, no travel, no parties, no big weddings. No El Rio tonight, folks. It's kind of like a prison. Let's see. Doris Lessing wrote a book in 1970 called Prisoner, Prisons We Choose to Live In. We choose to live in. So prison could be uh, a thankless job you stay in or the awful boss, but you don't quit. Or maybe that relationship you just can't end for complicated reasons. Then of course there's prison, 
lockdowns, bars, iron gates, armed guards, watchtowers, a dusty yard to walk around and around and around, except for head counts five times a day when everything stops to make sure you're you and where you're supposed to be and counted, not that you count. They just check you're there in your restricted life because uh, what? What did you do? You stole something, uh, sold drugs, took drugs, made drugs, you killed someone. Uh, you did something, got caught, and now you're in prison. Society's catch-all for people who become forgettable. In September 2018, during the truly obscene Kavanaugh hearings, I went to San Quentin very early one morning to see a program called Parallel Plays, performed by some inmates based on their recent work with the wonderful Marin Shakespeare Company. I love Shakespeare. The tragedies, the comedies, the history plays, the Richards, the Henrys. The, the, of the, I love Shakespeare and these plays every year, Marin Shakes fosters one of them right there at St. Quentin. And the play is studied, discussed, picked apart, and finally staged by inmates, convicts, culprits, lifers, criminals, also known as level two tumbleweed. Right there at San Quentin, incarcerated men doing time doing Shakespeare, felons spend a year becoming actors in plays written 400 years ago that still speak loud to the human condition. Wow. So after they do one public show, they write their takeaway stories and that's the show I saw. It knocked me out. Their honesty, wit, their vulnerability about what Lear did to each of them while a red-faced Brett Kavanaugh lied through his teeth on national TV, one of the actors who played Cordelia, Lear's daughter, told the audience the shock he felt once he put on Cordelia's dress, how terrifying it was to experience the male gaze. All their takeaways, songs, stories, rap poetry, made me and the audience laugh and cry and standing ovation. And being me, of course, I cornered the director right away. I mean, I love Shakespeare, right? Yeah, and I've got things to offer. Uh-huh, I've got creative skills, life-saving skills. Didn't creativity save my life? Age three in a dysfunctional family? Right. How can I help here? What can I do? You know, half these men have dyslexia. I heard it. I heard it just now on the stage. I know dyslexia when I hear it. I used to teach kindergarten and I ran children's school and, and I take authentic movement. This is that. My heart is authentically moved right now. Yeah, and my mind, I mean, I know stuff. I'm a playwright. I'm a nationally produced playwright, award-winning, okay? Yeah, yeah, and I don't mind wearing pink. I get it, it's required, you're a female and you're a visitor, you wear pink, it's not my color, but I don't care, okay? Yeah, I give her my card. Did you hear those exclamation points? I count them, 11 auspicious or what, okay? When I get home that day, I Google the number. 11 has vibrations of enlightenment. It indicates great trials, but even greater potential. Okay. A month later, I get a call. What's the next play, I ask? You'll write it. This is not the Shakespeare group. This is the veterans group. At one o'clock the following Thursday, and for a year of Thursdays after that, I sit in a circle with 20 incarcerated former combat veterans. Some of them are there for life, some less. Some have never gotten mail. Their ages, 19 to 78. Their names, they say, Doug, U.S. Navy. James, United States Air Force but soon they get really into it. 
maggot, jarhead, squid, asshole, addict, damaged unit. Everybody's laughing. Their wars, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan. They tell me stories. I write down every word by hand. You can't bring a laptop. I fill five notebooks. It takes a year. The guys my age say I'm their favorite hippie chick. These same men, well, I marched against that war and they were that. They were, well, I didn't get who they were. Jesus, we were all very young. I'm 73 when we meet now, an introvert with social anxiety. And when I'm there in that circle doing improv, telling stories, somehow it feels like home, the one I wanted. How does that work? Crossing the yard, coming in every week, I nod to men circling around. Sometimes we wave. Hey, young lady, always gets a smile. One man every week, he's seven feet, easy, lean, long dreads, regal. And he always says hello, and I still can't describe the tone. Very earnest, solemn, like I'm entering a sanctuary and we shake hands every time. Week after week, the play evolves. It's called The Field from a Rumi poem. There is a field beyond right and wrong, and I will meet you there. I ask a lot of questions about early memories, kid stuff, teen stuff. Yeah, were you drafted? Why'd you enlist? for country, for my fellow Americans, to help the cause, whatever cause. But why the Air Force? Why the Marines? Why the Marines? My dad, my granddad, all my uncles, the men in my family. How about that? Why I enlisted? Hey, I'm a patriot. Wasn't gonna just stand by, I'm a Jersey man. Where I grew up, there's all these statues, Lafayette here, George Washington there. Hey, what, I'm just going to sit there? Why I joined Connie. She was 15, I was 17. She got pregnant. Her dad was a big wig. He threatened to have me put in jail, so it all blew up. It was just crazy. That's why I joined, to spare my parents I didn't think I was coming back from Vietnam. I was sure about that. I'd ask them, tell me a time when you felt safe. A time when you didn't feel safe. Tell me a time you couldn't stop laughing. The last time you cried. The last time you danced. And they all came home from their wars addicted. Tells you a lot about decruitment. Hmm? The hours go fast from soul search to hilarity. These guys are storytellers. These guys have bullshit monitors. So everything is true and honored. They're veterans healing veterans. That's the name of the group. They want to understand the road that led to San Quentin. San Quentin, a hyper macho world. But did you know it's named for Quentin, a Miwok warrior who fought and died there? So warriors healing warriors every Thursday afternoon. The first read through of the final script, I am stunned I even took this on. I'm humbled at the privilege having lived a sheltered life where I hid my feelings more than not. But hey, it's their words, it's their stories, not mine. I'm just praying they won't wince at how I put it together. We sit in a circle, I pass out copies. We read the play aloud one by one. And when a few men stumble, dyslexia, 
illiteracy never kept a man from joining the military, and neither did childhood trauma, abject poverty, racism, and certainly not patriarchy. None of that stopped any man from being trained to kill. So they read the script, and when someone can't read, things slow down. No big deal. Everyone's patient. Everyone's helpful. They've all been shamed enough. Who did I think I was coming here? I can't imagine poverty, really. I can't imagine being black, being beaten by a stepdad, raped by a father, raped by an officer my first week out to sea. I can't imagine feeling safe because I'm in a gang. What are they gonna say when they finish reading the script? When they finish, there's this painful silence, sniffing. Richie's crying, Dave, Nate, they're wiping their eyes. Dave says, whoa. Jim laughs, shit, Ruth. Warren says, growing up, men solved problems like that. Silence and violence, it was all okay. Extension cords, belts, totally normal. That's what older guys did, right? Carlos says, it was all watch out, be strong. All my life, I never entered a room cool. And Jay says, I did anything to have a reputation. I changed my character to be a man. A lot of thank yous follow. Hey, Ruth. Thank you, Ruth. Fist bumps. Eye contact all around. But I can't talk. Being fully human, what a trip. The following week, it's raining like crazy. I arrive soaking wet because a guard takes my umbrella. It was too pointy. I'll get it when I leave. So the parts get cast, script in hand, and they're on their feet. It's happening. It's theater. As the meeting ends, I have to tell them, this feels like a miracle. Jay laughs and says, prison, sure. There's new foods out there I can't eat. How many new kinds of chips, kinds of beer? Yeah. Back at Solano, my best friends there were LWAPs. You get my meaning, no chance of ever getting out. And I was me and me, all about me. But my friends, I look back now and say, why was I whining? Now, if I'm gonna do this Buddhism thing, it's here, just doing what I can do. I mean, we're better than in the house of misery where miracles happen. Yeah, says Roach. I see miracles all the time. I meet people. You, for instance, I see your story, the past, present, future, all at once. I live with miracles. Who is this person? I know this person. We're connected. Say it's raining, like right now. Why should I come out and talk to you? But then I just, we let ourselves find out the why. You get what I mean? The why? You know how shamans explain the inconceivable in a way that's conceivable? Okay, but I cannot get algebra for nothing. How'd you get that answer? I don't know, but I got it. Can't explain it. Yes, prison. This place is an epicenter for world change. I don't know how. Like a floating rock. People who come here helping people, letting go of trauma. It's a miracle. And then Nate quotes Isaiah. Visit the prison house and set the prisoners free. He meant free inside. And Yahweh, him too, drawn to the ones he called the brokenhearted. You know, if Jesus was around today, he'd be walking in the yard. 
When I see through your eyes, it heals me. I can feel other people's pain. That never happened on the street, but it happens here. It's a miracle. The last time I saw them, they were well into rehearsal. Leslie from Marin Shakes was blocking the play. Most guys were already off book, unlike me tonight. The public performance would be April 23rd. That's Shakespeare's birthday. And I knew the gods and goddesses who banished spells made no mistake in placing me exactly where I was, not in the Shakespeare group, but with this band of brothers who'd survived so many battles. So leaving, heading to the gate, I cross the yard and I see my solemn friend. We stop, shake hands. And he says, like always, enjoy your freedom. And he means it. He's not cynical. COVID-19 closed San Quentin to visitors and volunteers March the 10th. So of course there was no play this year. Just please pray they'll all survive. I wrote the group a letter to thank them one more time for what they taught me, what they gave me. But I didn't know how to start it. Dear guys, dear men, dear group, dear veterans of damaging wars, dear Don, Richie, Mario, Tall, Kelly, Kenny, Carlos, Nate, uh, dear Brother Jay, dear Dave, Doug, James, dear Jim, Chris, Roach, dear Michael and Ted. I settled on Dear Band of Brothers, but I almost wrote Dear Unforgettables, because they are that, every single one. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth, um, that, that for for sharing that you know, that you know obviously very important story um, for you, and um, I, I it's it's a terrific story, and we will all of you in the in the audience we, again we will have some time for some Q and A, and I've I've got a few questions, so you'll be able to share those through the chat. So thank you uh, for that work. Um, we're going to move on here um, to our second performer. Um, Lori Chances uh, comes to us uh, with a novel under her belt and I believe a full-length play, but she's taken some time out to um, create this piece of work here. Um, it's a new piece called Morning Doves et al. So everyone please welcome Lori Chances. Wake as my boyfriend slides out of bed. He knows better than to say anything, not good morning or love you, God forbid, no questions. He knows better. When my consciousness is tinged with even a tiny bit of sleep, I get livid when I'm woken up. Oh, fuck, I've been known to murmur, <laughs> shout even, no matter how much I love the person who's just woken me up, it's something about transitions. Transitions, well, okay, here's the truth. If it's after 4 a.m., my awakening can be blamed on a hot flash. And then another, and then another, until I'm wiping my brow and my breast with a t-shirt I've just replaced with a new one. But on this particular morning, I say nothing. It is way too early. I remember that my boyfriend has said something about having to get up early to go to the DMV. I'm awake enough to remember this, but not awake enough to realize it isn't really the middle of the night. Oh, the room is dark or almost completely dark. And even if my bladder says it's morning, I'm not having any of it. No, it's too fucking early. But my bladder wins and I haul myself upright. I swing my reluctant legs over the side of the bed. I don't worry about the fuzzy slippers. It's dark, 
well, not so much dark, but orange, eerie, glowing. And my boyfriend, he's backlit in the kitchen with this grotesque pumpkin haze. The same color the moon was the night before, but I can't put two and two together. But the kitchen, it looks haunted. And my boyfriend's face, mm, I try not to meet his eyes, afraid he might want to kiss, might dare to wake me from my half sleepwalking stupor. It takes me way too long to pee. Probably fell asleep sitting there, but this isn't all that different from most mornings. But that look that I caught on my boyfriend's face. I shuffle back to bed, curl into a ball, realize that's my bad side, turn over and realize at 56, I don't really have a good side. It's so dark, how was I supposed to know it was already after 7 a.m.? Back in bed, I toss and turn, and sometime between insisting for the 20th time, fuck you, I'm not getting up! I hear the birds, <laughs> the birds, the, the birds who gather at my bird feeder, at, at the little dishes of seed I place all around the bird feeder. To be fair, to spread the wealth, to create my vision of a world where there's enough. If it's still pre-dawn and my boyfriend has left the house at some ungodly hour of darkness, why are my birds chirping? Well, they're, they're waiting for me, or more accurately, for the fresh seed I put out each morning. I can hear the cheep, cheep, cheep of the finches and the hoo of the morning doves. Morning as in sad, not as in mourning. I even hear the screech of the scrub jay, and she never gets up till like 9 a.m. I have to get up. I have a job to do. Even if in uh, human terms, my first client is until 4.30 in the afternoon. No, no, I don't want to get up yet. I toss and turn, but it's too late. See, since the pandemic, I reached this point of no return in the mornings. This point where I'm met by this wave of worries. And it's, it's so big and so wide that if I could, I'd stay in bed all day. But, but there's the hot flashes and the pain of ruminating, the tossing and turning against horrific possibilities. I'd list my fears here, but what's the point? You live in the same America as I do. Let's focus on the birds. Okay, on a normal day, when I hear them, I get up. Begrudgingly, but the woozy feeling of being newly awake, it's a hell of a lot better than tossing and turning. Alternating fears about the death of democracy and how are we gonna pay for my mom's dementia care now that my brother's lost his job? No, on a normal day, I just get up. Before even making coffee, I walk outside, pitcher of seed in hand, and I refill the bird feeder, then the little silver coaster I've left on the railing, and then the large terracotta planter dish on the moss-covered chaise, a little here, a little there. I want to be fair. Enjoy your breakfast, little ones. I haven't had my coffee yet, so the sweet tone of my song, it's inexplicable. On a normal day, I then grind my coffee while the water boils in the electric kettle, Okay, sometimes I'm so tired, I drink the dregs of my boyfriend's cold coffee. Just to remind myself, caffeine has a positive effect. It will propel me through this morning hour when, okay, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with myself. It'll lend me some courage as I read the New York Times, attempt to keep a journal, as I pretend that my low carb homemade nut bread doesn't taste like cardboard. Just sitting at the dining room table, reading the newspaper online and drinking coffee, it can feel like taking a long walk on a short pier. It can feel like self-abuse, like I've put my heart and my lungs and my liver and my brain in a blender and pressed high. I get that confused and agitated and unable to decide if I should focus on ballooning virus positivity rates or on the lies flung from a maskless would-be dictator. Ah, you don't have to join me in the blender. Let's get back to the birds. <laughs> Was that a coup? Oh, not a coup as in what it, the orange monster is planning if he doesn't legitimately win tomorrow's ballot. No, no, no. A coup, coup, as in the song of my sweet gray favorites. I focus on their needs instead of on my 85-year-old mother, who, like the birds, I can only visit through a pane of glass who, like my doves, has no idea what's going on or that the world's going to hell in a handbasket. But unlike my little cooing friends, my mother hyperventilates when I visit. She asks, why do we have to wear these? As she pulls down her required blue mask. Mom, 
we're in the middle of a pandemic. Oh, why do we have to wear these? I watch the doves instead of visiting my mother. I watch the doves instead of trying to get new clients, instead of getting back under the covers some mornings, instead of crying. That's a normal day. Let's get back to September 9th when I pen this on my computer, when the sky was nearly dark except for this thick orange haze from the wildfires, when it was nearly 11 a.m., but it looked like 4 a.m., like, like the dawn I had in my mind accused my boyfriend of getting up and out of bed into. In reality, my boyfriend had gotten up at his usual 6.30. When I saw his face as I shuffled to the bathroom around 7, it reflected the disgusted terror he was experiencing, not, not really for himself, but because he loves me and cares about me and he knows how dark I felt recently. The awe and fear and concern he was experiencing, that was on my behalf. Oh, I should have sloughed off my menopausal negativity, I, my desire to stay asleep or at least semi-conscious. I should have met him there in our kitchen, embraced and let him hold me without, and without words convince me that we'd be okay, that we'd make it through this dark burnt orange haze together. But I didn't. By the time I do get up, I am disoriented. I grab my phone and it says 1014. And I'm like, nighttime? Or is this a dream, a nightmare? Have the fires reached San Francisco? I don't smell barbecue in the air. And the birds, they're still chirping in the orange glow. I check my clock on the stove and on the microwave and I am coming to. It is 10.15 a.m. and the world is on fire. It takes me about an hour to return my boyfriend's text from 9.49. Is it still freaky dark there? The N95s are on the hutch. Rose emoji, heart emoji. I finally have a boyfriend who sends me loving concern texts with thoughtful emojis. I finally have a boyfriend who worries about me without trying to control me. I, I finally have a boyfriend who believes I'm a little psychic and not completely crazy when I told him like months ago, we need to prepare. We need to prepare for a worse than normal fire season. I finally have a boyfriend who wants to hold me while the world is burning and democracy is dying and still and still the birds sing and chirp and tweet and eat the seed I've laid out for him, for them. <laughs> I hear them now, my birds. Like my boyfriend cares for me, I care for my birds and my boyfriend. I hear their mournful song and I stand ready. What can I possibly do for you, my loves? besides care and worry and make sure you have enough to eat? How can I alone make the skies blue and the air clear and the world safe? I don't know. And to be honest, I don't know how to entertain you if you're even out there. Oh, hi, honey. All I can do is sit on the side of my bed, look out the window and love you anyway. Thank you, Lori. Wow. Um, I, I think we're going to have some stuff to talk about. I think the audience as well. I mean, that, that just mirrors so much um, in my own head. And I have to say, I'm, I'm not quite at 56. I don't have a good side either. And it was kind of good to hear from someone else in that same book. But um, thank you. I'm gonna, we're we're going to let you chill here and move on to our last uh, performer. And uh, But we will be back. Um, so... Our final performer, um, for many years for me, kind of defined the Monday Night March. Arnie Warshaw, who has been a longtime staff member here at the March and uh, house manager uh, for the Monday Night March, and he's probably seen more solo performance than just about anyone I know. So I'm going to set up to unmute him here and turn him over. Let's see. Arnie, I just want to make sure we've got you unmuted here before I switch the spotlight. Okay, okay we're good. Um, so our final performer tonight, and, and again, stick around for the um, Q&A afterwards. Our final performer, Arnie Warshaw, with his piece, Fat Man Off the Port Bow. Good evening, friends 
and welcome to Obesity Theater. Tonight's episode, Nightmares of a Fat Man. There it is, Captain. I can see it. I can see the blowhole. Are you sure it's not a humpback whale? No, Captain, no. It can only be one thing. It's the big bulging belly for sure. Prepare for the belly. Prepare for the belly. I spent my whole life at sea, and I never dreamed that this day could come. I thought it was a crazier legend than Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, that one man could eat so much and let his belly grow so large, so immense, so obscenely obese, that it could detach from the rest of them and take on a life of its own. The wildest fever thing of legend I ever heard. They say this belly rolled its way to the seashore. It knew that floating on the water was the only way it could possibly survive. But before reaching land's end, it wanted to fill up. So it rampaged the food stocks of every house, farm, and store in its path. With its belly button, it did. Ah, uh, the orifice that once allowed nourishment in the womb from its dear mother had transformed itself into a ravenous, gluttonous mouth of sorts, inhaling long loaves of bread by the dozens, layers of layer cakes by the load, and tents full of tenderloin by the tongue. And when this behemoth of a belly ran out of anything you could possibly call food to commandeer while it still wasn't satiated. So it rolled over the palaces and estates of the lords and lieges and dukes and duchesses, inhaling emeralds and rubies and diamonds and gallons and gallons of gold doubloons until finally made its way to the water's edge and lit into the dark waters of the Atlantic. Aye, many a sailor and seaman has claimed to see a gargantuan mountain of adipose or human flesh floating among the waves and sea foam, spraying clouds of cocoa powder and Parmesan cheese high into the sky. But their attestations were waved away as nothing but the craziest rants and hallucinations of men, of rum-soaked men, desperate to see anything but salty water. But if it's really, truly the big bulging belly you see in up there from the crow's nest, why then we'll all be rich, rich, we'll spear that belly, pray strongest of winds, tow it to the nearest isle. Then we'll slice it open with a ten-man saw, climb down in our wading boots, then dig through all the undigested food with our shovels and pickaxes. And then we'll keep all the gold and jewels for ourselves, and we'll be the lords and lieges we will. Aye. Captain. I think the belly sensed us. Is it heading our way? Aye, sir. As a mighty clip, sir. And the blowhole, it's, it's, oh, dear God, it's dilating. It's getting wider and wider and bigger and bigger. If it gets any closer, it'll consume each and every one of us, right down to the first mate's parakeet Ophelia. Belly off the port bow! Belly off the port bow! Man the harpoons! Man the harpoons! Get ready! Get set! Fire! Fire! No! No, 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 don't! No, don't step my stomach! Don't! No, don't step! Oh, Jesus. Oh, Christ. Okay. It's just a nightmare. Just a bad dream, Arnie. You're at home in bed. It's okay. It's all right. Ugh. A crappy way to start the day. 
Ugh, I could have slept for another hour. Uh, I might as well turn on the news. Good morning. It's 6.35 here in the Bay Area. This half hour of news is brought to you by Shrunk, the new app that makes gastric bypass surgery at home as easy as click, cut, click. More online at shrunk.com. Expect a sunny day with highs in the mid-70s inland, while along the coast it'll be partly cloudy with highs in the mid-60s. Is the nation's obesity crisis giving you bad dreams? Are you tired of hearing that Americans are getting fatter by the minute? Oakland life coach Brad Weber says yes to both. Here's his perspective. I'm a caring person by nature, sympathetic and empathetic, always willing to listen to friends and family in their times of need. But after hearing news story after news story about obese people and their negative effect on society, particularly during this COVID pandemic, well, I've had it up to here. I love all people, even enormously fat people. But if they don't love themselves enough to put down the whipped cream, and take off the pounds, well then I don't see why I and every other insurance premium paying American with nutritional self-restraint should have to subsidize their medical care. And furthermore, ah, oh, furthermore this Brad, oh, shove an onion up your ass and fry it. Uh, I'm gonna try to sleep. Hey, hey, Heidi Ho, and welcome to another fun-filled episode of Who's a Fat Is That? The fast-paced game show where all of you at home get to laugh at hundreds of fat people, and they never know it. Contestants look at photos of headless fatties and are given two minutes apiece to guess as many as possible for fabulous cash prizes. For those of you new to our show, headless fatties are simply those poor, unfortunate slobs whose pictures crop from the neck up for maximum privacy, grace every TV, web, and newspaper story about today's raging obesity epidemic, along with sure to tickle your funny bone pictures of anonymous fatties bulging in all the right places. We mix in photos of portly family members, friends, and famously fat celebrities. In three qualifying rounds, contestants try to put a name to as many flabby photos as they can. Every correct answer is worth $1,222.33. And the first contestant to guess five or more of our fat friends moves on to our hot fudge round. Once there, once there, once there, once there, once there, once there, the lucky contestant will be shown a photo of one and only one headless fatty. A fatty with a highly conspicuous hot fudge stain smack in the middle of their ballooning belly. Naming that fatty earns the grand prize of $55,000 and 33 cents. Contestants, are you ready to play? Who's a fat is that? Uh, contestants, are you ready? Uh, contestants? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, it seems as if we're having a problem with our Zoom connection. Apparently, a uh, few too many of our pudgy pals are online right now ordering extra buffalo wing sauce. <laughs> hello? Uh, hello? Uh, can you hear me? I can't hear you. Am I on the Zoom? Hello? Am I on? I, I, I know the name of the fatty. I know who the fatty is. 
am I zooming? Can you hear me? Hello? Am I on? Uh, it seems we need another moment or two to solve our technical problems. Please stand by. I, I don't know if you, if you can hear me, but uh, I'm telling you, I know the fatty. Oh, I'd recognize that big bulging belly anywhere. It belongs to, uh, uh, oh, for God's sakes, I had it a second ago. It's, uh, oh, yeah, his name is Arnie. Arnie uh, Warshaw. Arnie Warshaw. <laughs> he works at the same place I do. You see that stomach head and you. You get out of the way fast. I mean, no offense or nothing. But that thing has a life of its own. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. I wouldn't surprise. I wouldn't be surprised if the guy gave birth to triplets. <laughs> hey, am I on? I mean, I named the fatty. I mean, I should win the 55,000. Did I win the 55,000? Did you hear me? My name? Well, no, his name. It's Arnie Warshaw. He's the fatty. Did you hear me? Yes, I heard it. And I've had quite enough of this garbage. I like Marsh performers who are emotionally honest. People who come to grips with their problems, overcome them, and tell stories about them. Honestly, this man is not funny anyway, and he's dangerously overweight, and he makes a big joke out of it all. Stomachs that turn into sea monsters, please. My father died of a massive heart attack on a couch watching professional wrestling with a half-eaten Costco-sized bag of pork rinds next to him. This is far too triggering for me. Triggered, bored, amused, confused. Whatever your feelings, this concludes another episode of Obesity Theater. Thank you so much for watching and good night. Thanks, Arnie. Um, let me join you here, so don't go away. Um, I'm gonna bring up our other performers here and bring you on. So um, thank you all. Thank you all for joining us and for sharing your work. Let me see. I'm going to, um, I just want to play around with the settings here so that everyone can see all of us here. And yeah, okay. So um, I, 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 there's one question that uh, I, I think it's, it's kind of obvious in a way, um, but, but it, did, it did sort of pop into my head in slightly different ways for all of you. And I want to start with you, Arnie, um, because like, as I said, you've probably seen more solo theater than any two of us here in this audience put together right now. Um, <laughs> I, I've been with the Marsh long enough that I might give you a run for your money, but I'm pretty sure you're ahead of me. And so as I was watching you, the, the beginning of your piece, I was thinking, gosh, in solo theater, we see so little um, pure fantasy. Uh, we don't see a lot of genre fiction. And here's Arnie running straight ahead with that. Um, and And then as you went on, I thought, well... Gee, is this is this Arnie, um, you know, uh, building solo theater with uh, under the limits of the pandemic that he has to be at home? Is this him trying something new? Um, so, how how has pandemic creativity in the age of the pandemic affected the creation of this piece? And and did did that affect this these sort of interesting elements you added to the piece? Yes, I, I would say that the pandemic was definitely an important part. I think part of it was, oh, there's so many things I could say about being a fat man, but especially during the pandemic, it seemed like, you know, I had the radio on a lot. I, I mean, I was working from home. I had the 
so between that and news stories, I felt like I was constantly seeing some update that said, you know, people with obesity uh, get COVID more often. People with obesity uh, don't uh, recover as well. People with obesity, people who are obese, people who are obese. And look, I'm 63 years old. I'm at an age, you know, I, I mean, I could talk a lot about food and weight and I, I don't, you know, I, I eat what I eat. I do what I do. But and I can't speak for any other fat person, but it gets overwhelming sometimes. And I sometimes wonder if this, you know, it's like obesity porn. We just love, we like, we, I feel like, I mean, yeah, there are real reasons why being fat is not healthy, but there's part of me that thinks that, you know, um, <laughs> we need others, you know? And even though Trump has certainly made people feel comfortable to other, all sorts of people, I guess sometimes I feel like, well, fat people will ask people to be other because anybody can be fat. And so I'll just say in terms of the kind of piece I did, uh, I mean, I like to tell stories. You know, last year at Monday Night Marsh, I told the story about my sister and my mother, and it was pretty serious. But there is part of me that's just, you know, I, I just like to be silly. And I thought, well, how can I just sort of talk about you know, how self-conscious I am about being fat and how much I think the world is looking at me and all this kind of crazy stuff. And I don't know, you know, I tried a whole bunch of different things and threw them out. I wrote a lot and threw it out. And this is kind of what I was left with. So I'll, I'm, I'm not sure quite where to take it from here. But anyway, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. And and the, 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 so I'd like to sort of pass the ball then on to Lori and Ruth, because as you're getting at this matter of the process. Ruth and Lori, you've both worked in um, more more uh, long uh, form uh, uh, media, you know, novels, full-length plays, uh, and uh, Lori, you come to us with this, um, you know, this, this finely tuned piece that, that I think um, focuses us on this, this very discreet piece of time, your morning, and then these very particular specific elements of that morning. Um, so sort of similarly to, to, to you, um, how, how has the, the, the pandemic existence affected your creativity? Did it, did it push you to this form or, or, um, well, I can say that, um, I started writing again after a, like a 10 year hiatus okay. because of a group that Ruth was in and it met at the marsh. And to be honest, um, I was really despairing. Not, I mean, the pandemic made everything worse, but just the Trump era, my father passed away. I mean, things just got, the shit got real. And I said to myself, I, I got this random thing in the um, in my email and I said, I need to get my community back. And I used to go to all the, mar well, not all of them, but a lot of the Monday Night Marshes. I've appeared at Monday Night Marsh. It inspired me to do a full length play, um, a full length one woman show. Um, but I was, you know, I was kind of sassier back then. I, I still had my confidence. And um, so I thought to myself, I need to bookend kind of the bravado I had in my 40s that that the marsh allowed me. I mean, I did this whole Marilyn Monroe get up and I thought I'm older now. So what what is going on? And the piece, you know, the reason I wanted it to be mourning is because I'm really sad, but it's really more about the fact that if I look at things, I get to wake up every morning whenever I want. I mean, obviously, but I, I wake up, I have this loving boyfriend, the birds, I have all day literally to watch the birds. And, you know, as the world burns, those birds are still out there chirping. And so I thought, well, what the heck? I mean, I can tell a little 10 minute story, but if anyone's, you know, in the audience and wondering whether or not to do this, I, I thought, to be honest, I thought I was just going to read it. It would be no big deal. I mean, it was just not going to be a big deal, but I feel that charge again you know, that charge that you get from creative people and being in community. And I'll never be on Broadway, but the Marsh community is a real thing. Like it's a real, and I, I loved the slideshow because it reminded me of all these performers that I love. And you know, it took hours to prepare for 10 minutes and they were kind of grueling like, oh, why am I even doing this? But after those 10 minutes, 
I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> I am so happy. I'm going to do that again. And I think that's what mental health is. I think mental health is doing the grueling part and then celebrating it. And um, yeah, this is the happiest. I mean, I've felt little happiness, but not a lot of happiness since we've been gearing up for the election and to see my friends and to feel like they're not going to stop us. No matter what happens this week or in the next couple months, they're not going to stop creative people. And we'll just have to come back and bitch some more if that's, mm. you know, what it's going to take. So thank you so much. It was really lovely. Oh, you're, you're welcome. You mirror so much of what I'm thinking and, and hold that thought. There's, I, I wanted to follow up, but I, I really like to keep this Q and A as little about me as possible and, and move over to you, Ruth. Um, Ruth, this is obviously really so emotional and important to you, this story. And, and again, thank you so much for sharing it. And, um, wow, I'm, I'm starting to tear up a little bit here thinking about it. This this story you tell that that approaches, I think, the the loss we feel in the pandemic times in, in a different way. This this community, these these of, of, of men and women who were taken away from you in that way by the by the closing of San Quentin and, and you haven't you've lost contact with them. Um, and um, where, where is there more to this story? You, there feels like there's so much. And if, and if this is where you wanted to stop it again, you've given us so much, but, but is there more coming from this again, given that you've worked in, in, uh, the, the medium of full length plays, uh, and multi-character works? Uh, well, uh, there is a full length play that was written. There is a full length play. Uh, um, and it's based on the stories that they told. Um, and I shaped and I cut and pasted and I added and I, and that play will be performed. Um, writing this piece was a real surprise. Um, Lori, Lori and I, as she said, used to write together and um, she put out a call months ago about her um, her wish to do a Monday Night March, and she said, "Will anybody, will anybody please join me?" And I thought, "Sure," um, but I wasn't really thinking at the time that this would be um, what I would do. In fact, I was very busy doing something else. I was writing a um, public service announcement about early voting called "Cecilia Delivers." Um, starring Kimberly Richards, um, and I produced it, and it's on YouTube and on Instagram, and it's fantastic, and um, anyway, Facebook, but it's too late to vote by mail. Um, but um, when I actually sat down to write this, I realized um, how painful it was for me to not have closure with a group. Um, and I knew that it was painful for them to not have closure too, because I've heard from some of them. Um, and uh, it was just, it was a life-changing experience for me to be there, to, you know, living in a world where men rarely devote time to reflection about their lives and the why of mm -hmm. who they are and where they are. Um, I haven't experienced that world a lot and being immersed in it. As I said, these guys have no, you know, they have bullshit monitors. So it's all very real. And their, um, their love for each other and their support of each other, cross generations, cross races, cross classes, um, and cross, you know, outcomes. Some of them are there for life. The other interesting thing was for me, really great. A lot of people, you know, some people I know would, you know, when they, when they knew I was doing this, they'd say, Aren't you afraid? Are there guards in the room? Are there, you know, and I have never felt as safe in a group of men as I did in that room. Ever. Um, you now they, they were veterans. All yes. former combat vets. Um, and I, I'm an army brat. 
myself, and it was interesting to hear you talk about that military experience and then that they are prisoners. And you, mm -hmm. so you allude to this a, uh, a bit. Did, do you feel it's given you any insights on the topic of masculinity in our culture? Are you kidding? Um, maybe we don't have long enough for you to go into it, no, but but you certainly don't. you you certainly dropped uh, some some really interesting uh, thoughts on that. I'll say one more thing. My okay. background um, is in early childhood development, and so of right. course that's what I brought to a lot of my focus because I knew that um, I, yeah I just knew the trauma began much earlier than combat and we got to explore that together and of course i think about my childhood you know and why i am who i am but they did that too and they did it very very bravely and it was it, just beautiful and powerful and um you gotta you gotta honor that i mean yeah and and thank you for doing that um it, it was it was wonderful that you did that. Now, what is the name of the play that uh, the field? Written? The field. Um, I'm, now, I'm going to say to our performers, by the way, um, uh, Ruth, you just mentioned uh, your Instagram. If if any of you have um, websites or social media where the audience may be able to follow you, f please feel free to put that in the chat. Um, cause I'm I don't sure have I'll... that. The okay. The okay. Instagram and that, that, is that, that, Cecilia that. delivers. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'd, I'd like to bounce back to um, Arnie and Lori there. Lori, at some point in your piece, you you had a line. I can't remember exactly what the line was, but but it, I think you were kind of questioning whether, um, you know, your uh, uh, whether what you were doing this this creative uh, th this attempt to to delve into the world to really look at it and try and um, turn it into something creative. And, and, you, and you, you seem, I think you kind of question whether, uh, gosh, is this sort of navel gazing self abuse? I think you did oh. use the word self abuse. And, <laughs> that was and actually about how much time I spend on the New York Times, the self abuse <laughs> part. But I do also question, um, I do question how many hours I spend four hours a day writing. And I sometimes sit there and I go and and to what end shouldn't I be working with orphans? You know, that kind of thing. But um, I would honestly say that uh, I, I would be on a heck of a lot of medication if I did not have my writing. And I was. Um, the Marsh was the end of a, I think, 15 years on antidepressants. And then I started doing a show and I, started meditating and my life changed. And I'm at a point now, I also teach, and I actually feel like it's because you have a voice. Like in therapy, you have 50 minutes, but when you write a novel, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know that, like that's the whole thing at the end, like I don't even know if anyone's out there. I mean, obviously we can count how many people, but I don't know that that's the important part. I don't yeah. know. I don't think it's about the, the I mean, I want whoever's, witnessing it to get something but i do think it's inherently a a life-saving act and mm -hmm. what i said to my boyfriend just before the show started was that no matter what happens um i i want to remember that that just a few people being seen by a few people and witnessing other people's pain is is a life um even in a pandemic. Um, yeah, I, I agree, and it, I think this is this is a great way to segue over to um, Arnie. Uh, sort of similar question, you know, there, this this self examination that is so so much a part of solo performance can feel a bit like self abuse. I, I think I think most creative acts can feel like that if you are really pouring yourself into it. It can be difficult and painful. Um, and, and so Arnie, I think you were getting at that as well. And 
so your thoughts on on kind of that line but uh, or that element of possible element of self-abuse and also then uh springing off of what laurie just said arnie as as longtime house manager of the monday night marsh your thoughts of um you know this solo performance work as as an outlet as as a maybe even a healing thing what you have seen over your years i'd love to hear your thoughts on that well first i'll, I'll say you know that for me uh, back in the late 90s i did as my final mfa project when i was up at humboldt state i did my first uh, like a full-length solo piece about being fat and then a couple of years later, uh, I did a piece at the Fringe Festival. And I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain, but in a weird way, even though I go around the world as a fat person, I sort of feel like I'm in the closet about it in a weird way. I think because, I, you know, I was brought up with a lot of shame around it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I loved my mother, wonderful woman, but even in dementia till almost the last two years of a 95 year old life, you know, well, they put me on a scale this morning and I weighed 110 pounds. I put on four pounds, you know, and I tried to say, don't talk to me about this, but she had dementia. She couldn't remember. And I made a choice to, if she was far away to speak with her every day. And so, you know, I've dealt with this stuff in therapy. Like I said, I did these shows, but I sort of felt like there was this way where I kind of, it, you know, like wanted to sort of come out of the closet, but so I wrote these things that were more sort of confessional. I wrote some things that were more direct and it didn't feel, it was like, eh, I don't know, you know, what am I doing here? And so I decided, you know, um, this, it would be more fun to do it the way it did. Uh, I did it. But let me say this in terms of Monday Night Martians. What a gift it's been for me. I mean, yeah, it's a job. I get paid for it. But... And I, you know, there's been some amazing uh, people who are, you know, perform main stage shows at the March. But I have seen so many performers perform Monday night that may never perform again, that even sometimes, you know, their performance isn't that great, but the story that they're telling is so human, right? there, you know, childhood abuse, sexual abuse, time in prison, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of things. And it just, it blows me away, you know, um, at the courage that people have. Uh, so, you know, uh, <laughs> that's, you know, I think part of my little feeling guilty is sort of at the end, right? Because I know that a lot of people come to the march because they want to see a certain kind of, not therapy, but people sort of bearing themselves honestly, emotionally, and you know, like I said, it's not like I couldn't have gotten up and talked about the pain of my mother and all, and father and being fat as a kid. It just wasn't where I was at. But I, I truly, you know, uh, admire the people who really uh, put their stuff right out there so much. Yeah, and, and we thank the three of you for, you know, giving us this, this really frank honesty and vulnerability in your work. Um, so but before we close out, um, this may come off as a little self-serving here, but Lori, this came in my mind uh, during your piece particularly, and then in, in different ways, I think, as, especially as we've talked about the pandemic. Um, Lori, you talked about that day on September 9th when, I mean, it looked like the freaking apocalypse out there. Um, and uh, for me personally, I remember that vividly. I think we all do. Um, and for me, it was it was kind of a remarkable day, similar to the, the piece you described. Um, I've just tossed a link into the chat. That was the morning when, um, in my capacity here at the March, I had an appointment to interview Jeff Hoyle, this, the yeah. performer many of you, yeah. uh, you, you may have seen his work, Geezer or Lear's Shadow, or uh, just wonderful, wonderful work. I had a Zoom appointment to talk to Jeff to do an interview for, to, uh, to uh, promote one of his upcoming appearances. And we were sitting there in the dark in our respective homes. I mean, it was like we were sitting in caves. And, but Jeff 
he talked about his art and his work and it just made me feel so much better. I was so glad I had this conversation with this man. And um, so if, if you do kind of click on the link, you'll recognize the face that introduces it. Um, but it really was a wonderful piece. I've been meaning to re-edit for it for our, our YouTube channel. And um, again, it may sound self-serving, but I thought it, for me, it was such a wonderful moment uh, and kind of cast light on on this pandemic as as the work of the three of you has as as you have persevered to create this again to to share your vulnerability and your craft uh and i thank you all for that um i will say to you and to the audience that uh we will be this performance will be up on our youtube channel for reviewing if you know people who you think might weren't here would like to see it please uh share that around and uh, again, thank you, thank you all, thank the three of you for sharing with us. Thank you, the audience, for being here with us. If you can support us through the tip jar, that's great. Um, we'll hope to see you back for, for more work here. Uh, we're gonna keep on giving it to you uh, as long as we have breath in, in our body. So thank you all, um, and, and good night to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You're thank great, you so great host. Yeah, really great. Thanks, guys. Thank so much, we'll, we'll hope we'll hope to see you soon. Yeah. Everybody, All right. terrific. Bye, bye, Lori and Ruth. Great work. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank yeah. you. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Wonderful. bye.